So it's a true honor this afternoon to welcome Kaiser Guo to the University of Wisconsin. Kaiser's career is not easily summarized as his experiences are both varied and very interesting, okay? But I think perhaps the best way to introduce Kaiser is as a rock star in both the literal and figurative sense senses of the word. In the literal sense, he is a founding member of the Tang Dynasty, which can rightly be called China's first heavy metal band. Kaiser co-founded this band in 1989 while spending some time in China after earning his BA from Berkeley. He would do two stints in the Tang Dynasty and remain involved in the Chinese music scene for many years after. In the early 1990s, Kaiser returned to the US to begin his PhD in East Asian studies at the University of Arizona. And like many of the visionaries of his generation, including uh, Elon Musk and Sergey Brin, Kaiser had the thirst for knowledge to begin a PhD, but the good sense to drop out before that thirst was beaten out of him. So prior to completing his dissertation, he left the University of Arizona to resume his career in China as a rock star and to work for a number of internet media and media firms, including a six year stint as the director of international communications at the search giant Baidu. In 2010, together with Jeremy Goldcorn, Kaiser founded a weekly podcast on Chinese current affairs called Seneca. 13 years and nearly 400 episodes later, the Seneca podcast is now the flagship of the China Project, a New York-based, China-focused uh, information and business services platform. It publish, publishes thousands of articles on China every year and offers some of the most insightful coverage of China that can be found anywhere today. It is as the host of the Seneca podcast that, Ch that Kaiser became a rock star in the figurative sense of the word. And in a rough parallel to the shredding and thrashing that he did as a guitarist in the Tang Dynasty, he harmoniously conducts his guests through intelligent and insightful conversations about China and US-China relations. Kaiser's guests on Seneca range from academics to novelists, to business owners, to activists, to Chinese American policymakers, both active and retired. And the tagline of the Seneca podcast is covering China with neither fear nor favor, which Kaiser does in every episode, guiding his guests in discussions of their specialty in a way that is both accessible to casual listeners while also engaging with specialists. And that is a truly remarkable feat to accomplish. It was this accessibility that initially drew me to the Seneca podcast in 2019, when I assumed my current role as the Associate Director of CIS. And although my background is in the history of Korea and US-Korean relations, I was told when I took this position that it could no longer be all Korea all of the time for me. So I needed to find a way to branch out and educate myself on the other nations of East Asia without doing a second PhD, which I did not have the time for. So I remember Googling, is there a good podcast on China that I can listen to? And very quickly discovered Seneca. And I have been a devoted listener ever since, as I hope all of you will be by the end of the event tonight. The importance of Kaiser's work with Seneca and the China Project has only grown over time as the relationship between China and the US has deteriorated rapidly in the past several years. And the reasons for this are as complex as they are important. And there is probably no better source for understanding this deterioration in relations than to go back and listen to the back catalog of the Seneca podcast for the past several years. And what differentiates Kaiser's work from the many who cover China and current affairs is his, em his emphasis on cognitive empathy in our understanding of China. And to be clear, this is not a defense of Chinese policies or policymakers, but rather a description of what China, what the US, and what the world might look like through Chinese eyes. And crucially, this cognitive empathy is not just reserved for Chinese elites and Chinese policymakers, but is used to try to curry empathy with an astonishing variety of members of Chinese society. And recent episodes have examined China's COVID lockdowns and the repression of Uyghurs in Xinjiang through the eyes of residents who actually experience those lockdowns and through the eyes of Uyghur human rights activists who have spent their careers trying to bring this issue 
to the forefront. By now, I hope I've convinced you just how good the Seneca podcast is. It is excellent. You should all listen to it. But the American media market is vast, and it is increasingly focused on China. And I suspect that many of you, like me, are confronted every day, or at least certainly every week, with news and analysis about China, some of which is the, the work of true specialists and people who are very knowledgeable about China, and some that is not. And I experienced this firsthand in February. <laughs> in the days after a Chinese spy balloon was spotted over Montana, I received no fewer than four invitations to be interviewed by local media outlets in Wisconsin on this topic. And I accepted all of these invitations on the principle that it doesn't take a lot of expertise on China or spy balloons to tell everyone to just take a deep breath, calm down, and let our multi-billion dollar defense intelligence industry work on this problem. However, the number of invitations that I received in such a short period of time raised troubling questions for me about who is commenting on China, what their qualifications are, and how can we judge their analysis? How can we tell good China analysis from bad? This is a vital topic that grows more important every day. And I'm delighted that we have Kaiser here to give us some strategies for navigating how we can analyze this coverage that is shaping our current media landscape. Please join me in welcoming Kaiser Grohl to the University of Wisconsin. Thanks so much, David, and to Lori and to all the other good people who have invited me so kindly to beautiful Madison. Um, my daughter is a badger here. Uh, she was unable to join because dutifully, as a good Chinese American daughter should be, she's attending class. Um, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Really, really happy. Um, in, in the course of my, my life these days, I'm often asked, are we now in a cold war with China? About four years ago, pondering this very question, I was part of a group of of specialists who work on, on China issues. And one of the wiser participants suggested that a state of cold war between two nations exists when the principal organizing idea of, of each society, when maybe the, the major organizing principle of life in each is hostility toward the other. And I thought, phew. We're not there yet. Gosh, I mean, we're still a long way from there. Surely and things are bad, but surely they ain't that bad. Since then, of course, it feels very much like hostility or at least a contestation with China is fast becoming, if indeed has not already become the most important organizing principle in this country. It's the way that we sell every major piece of legislation, after all. I mean, notably, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the Chips and Science Act. We've had now more than 125 mass shootings in this country in 2023, and we're only in April. And yet, Congress can get together, thank God, you know, they can put aside partisan differences to focus on the really important task of banning TikTok. Seriously, though, infrastructure investment, uh, domestic semiconductor production, revitalizing manufacturing, all these are very important things, but it, it's all packaged, at least, as being about China. We are in a precarious moment, I hope you all understand, uh, and that before it's, it's too late, uh, we should realize that we need to move our relationship to a different footing. It is still, after all, our most consequential bilateral relationship, and one that is in deep, deep doo-doo. I realize that as an American of Chinese descent, uh, perhaps, you know, especially as one who spent most of his adult life actually living in China, I maybe have more at stake than, than many people, but uh, you should all realize that the consequences of an actual war with China and, and such a war has never felt more horrifyingly possible than right now it would be just catastrophic for all countries and, and not just for the two great powers. Uh, when we seem to converge as the House Select Committee on competing with the Chinese Communist Party seemed to, in its first hearing, uh, which was just a couple of weeks ago, around this language of, of China's ruling party as an existential threat, 
to the US. Either we are using really irresponsible hyperbole, which I hope, or we really do think that it's an existential threat, which means either they die or we die. In either case, my reaction in watching how we have responded to China in recent months and years has not been anger, it's not been frustration, it's been embarrassment. I felt a deep, keen embarrassment at the US reaction to this. We are not behaving like a confident superpower that still believes that upholding our core values, our institutions at home, our openness, our freedoms, our diversity, our rule of law, our democracy will prevail, will appeal to and attract, will ensure that we continue to innovate. I am embarrassed at the way that we're talking about China as if it's all powerful, it's 10 feet tall, it's indestructible, that somehow it will steamroll us uh, and that we're helpless before it. We have lost our confidence and we're losing more than that. We're, we're, we're losing our faith in those things that I think make us American. We're lashing out in, 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 in Kuwait and, and just, again, frankly, embarrassing spasmodic paroxysm. Uh, it's, it's just really unbecoming and it's dangerous to our future and I think to our way of life. I don't think that most Americans have any real sense of the extent to which the world's two biggest economies still remain so intertwined, uh, despite all this talk about decoupling. I don't think they have a sense of the shock that would come from a, genu a genuine abrupt decoupling. I mean, few seem aware that the quality of life to which they've grown accustomed depends very much on advanced semiconductors made on the very fault line of this looming Sino-American contest in Taiwan, of course. We fret about global warming and we should, but there is very little appreciation for just how carbon intensive the activity of arms racing is, let alone how bad an actual large scale kinetic war would be in that respect. I shudder to think also of what life would be like in this country for people who look like me or who look like members of my family or who look like many people in the audience here tonight as part of a community that is already experiencing horrific levels of hate, whether in speech or in the form of actual violence. Recent events have, have me really worried about our ability as a country to think seriously and to craft reasonable, effective policy when it comes to China. It's, it's hard for me to imagine that any dispassionate observer could have watched the collective response to the Chinese spy balloon and concluded that we behaved with the good sense, with the dignity, with the poise, with the equanimity of a superpower. I mean, our panic right now over TikTok feels like other moral panics with which I am unfortunately familiar, like over satanic pedophile cults in the 1980s performing sacrifices or Dungeons and Dragons leading us to, you know, belief in witchcraft and Satanism. And, you know, of course, heavy metal backmasking, right? And, and things like that. We, comic books in the 1950s or reefer madness. We've been through our share of moral panics and we're in the throes of one once again. The way China has become a means of scoring domestic political points as if what we say and what we do doesn't affect the actual relationship or somehow shape in any way China's responses to it as if China isn't real, but is rather this just kind of distant concept. Uh, it, it deeply worries me how we, we behave as if it's just sort of a fantasy. To far too many Americans, China is just this abstraction that we invest with our fears and with our insecurities, but also gets painted in the minds of some people as some sort of techno-utopian fantasy land, where the land of where, you know, technocratic uh, government has somehow triumphed. Uh, China seems to have become, for many Americans, just a way for us to feel better about ourselves, to enjoy sort of a sense of moral superiority. There is a line that I really like from a speech that President Obama once gave in Oslo, Norway, when he was admittedly a little prematurely given the Nobel Peace Prize. But in that speech, he said, I'm trying to do my best Obama here. Well, I know that engagement with repressive regimes lacks the satisfying a purity of indignation, right? I know that engagement with repressive regimes lacks the satisfying purity of indignation. 
in the years since his presidency ended, we have abandoned the idea of engagement with China altogether. Few people now are willing to come to the defense of the policy, and somehow both Republicans and Democrats have converged on the idea that engagement was a failure. Time permitting, I would be very happy to talk about why I am one of the few people who would still leap to its defense. But um, the point that I want to make today uh, is that on our political left, we regularly bathe in what President Obama rightly described as that satisfying purity of indignation over human rights abuses that are very real in Xinjiang or in Hong Kong, uh, the Chinese surveillance state, censorship, the quashing of dissidents without uh, you know, enough thought given to the best way to address those real issues. We, we, we are, feel this deep indignation about it, uh, but don't really try to come to realistic answers as to how to deal with it. On the right, in the meantime, um, we get a lot of chest thumping, jingoistic bluster, what I've come to think of as Taiwan tumescence. Uh, it's very, very common now, as well as the, the sort of cynical weaponization of the human rights issues that I've talked about, which really only galvanizes Beijing. After all, the Chinese people have no more reason than I do, or I hope any of you do, to believe that the very same people who backed the Muslim ban during the Trump administration would suddenly leap to the defense of oppressed Muslim peoples in a faraway land. They understand it as they should, as the cynical weaponization. And that is a pity because there really are serious human rights abuses going on there. And uh, that we afford China sort of the cover of being able to describe these accurately, I, sh I should add, as weaponization is really a, a, a bad thing. But we're in a place right now where one side, let's call them the China hawks, uh, by way of shorthand, they have a sort of succinct, straightforward, easy, binary kind of Manichaean view of things, a really easy answer as to how we should proceed in our policy with China. I mean, it feels to them, at least, and to many of us, principled and clear-eyed and tough. What's more, um, their arguments on, on China really accord with the facts as most people in the US, it seems, have come to accept them. And that is irrespective of whether they watch CNN or Fox, whether they listen to AM talk radio or they listen to NPR. Meanwhile, you ask somebody from the other side, let's call them by way of shorthand, my side. And you know, you're treated to a long and detailed history lesson, complex textual interpretation, a picture of the relationship painted in 87 different shades of subtle gray. Uh, Sit down for three hours while I walk you through the incredible complexities of this. Who is going to prevail in our current intellectual climate? So many times in recent months, I've been in rooms full, so many times, in, in rooms full of people who are genuine uh, analysts of China, who have put in the years, who have put in the work, who really do speak the language, have skin in the game, have worked and lived there for a very, very long time. These are not panda huggers or communist dupes. These are people who've worked in the intelligence community, who've worked in government, who are serious thinkers. They understand well the challenges that China does pose, but the, the disconnect between them and the Washington blob, let's call them, on, on the really big issues. What does China want? What are China's genuine aspirations? What is the likelihood that China will try to forcefully take Taiwan? Questions like these. You know, how do we respond to China's growing technological prowess? What uh, is China's posture really toward Russia and toward the Ukraine war? The disconnect between people on the Hill and in the Pentagon and these experts, these genuine experts who I, I'm talking about here, is profound. And it's really profoundly disturbing that there is such a gigantic disconnect. The fact is, though, as David was saying, we are all citizens of, of a democracy. We're faced with important decisions about how to move forward with policy toward China. It's just such an issue of enormous significance. And irrespective of whether you're an elected official or a business leader or an undergraduate student, whether you are somebody uh, who's a journalist or an activist or a member of our military, you're just some guy who likes to sound off on Twitter um, or on TikTok. We need to develop a smart set of policies not just an attitude. We've got plenty of attitude, and that's about all we actually have when it comes to China. But the reality is that not all of us, indeed, very, very few of us are equipped to. We don't dedicate most of us our lives or even much time to understanding 
China well, to becoming truly informed about China. Instead, we need to know who among the multitude of people out there who write about China, who pontificate out there on the cable networks or the Sunday morning talk shows, who advocate for this policy position or that, who are engaged in the analysis of China, who, who among these people should we be listening to? Who should we be taking seriously? So how do we know what to believe? You know, let me first be clear that this is not an argument that says that only people with PhDs in Chinese studies or proficient in the language who have spent years and years living in China are the ones who can be trusted. No, I think there is no political litmus test either. To be perfectly honest with you, there are plenty of people on uh, the Republican side of the aisle who I think are, are very wise and have very measured and, and quite intelligent approaches uh, who are you know, either Republicans or political conservatives of some stripe, and quite a few people on uh, the left, on the Democratic side of the aisle, who certainly do not pass muster uh, as far as I'm concerned. So in my role as the host of the Seneca podcast, I see it as my, my, my job mainly to pick people, to find the right guests to bring onto the show. People who, well, first of all, aren't going to say stupid and embarrassing things, but uh, you know, about people who, who's, it's not about whose arguments I necessarily agree with. I mean, granted, it is not an adversarial show. It's not hard talk. It's not all about gotcha. Uh, you know, it's generally a place where I'm going to afford people an opportunity to unpack their ideas, their often complex ideas, and, and they won't always be things that I'm in full agreement on. But I, I don't want to give a platform to people I think fail to exhibit certain qualities. In my 13 years now doing this show, I, I think I've developed a sense for what qualities really matter the most and for how to tell whether they are present or absent in any given individual. And so what are these criteria? What are these, these qualities? I would identify five of them. Humility, first of all, a sensitivity to bias, a holistic approach, a sense of historical acuity, and lastly, and most importantly, as David talked about, cognitive empathy or strategic empathy. Now we can dispense with humility pretty quickly, I think. Here's a rule, when somebody describes him or herself as a China expert, you can dismiss or at least seriously discount what that person has to say. You fortunately won't hear it too often these days, but out there, if you're listening and you are still calling yourself a China expert, please stop. It's just, it's embarrassing. Look, look for people who are candid about the limitations of what we can know. Even the, you know, deservedly, uh, the, 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 the reputation that China has quite deservedly uh, the, the, for its political system being quite opaque, there is simply a lot that we cannot know. People should admit this up front and show a little epistemic humility. When so many cherry picks quotes from a handful of speeches or documents and make some sweeping argument, a generalization with great certainty, you can be sure uh, that it's just as easy to cherry pick statements that completely contradict such claims. The fact is we just don't know in, in many of these cases and we really ought to have the humility to admit that that is the case. We should also look for evidence of cultural humility, which as you'll see, ties in with a number of these other attributes that I've enumerated that I hope that we look for. Cultural humility, humility involves a lot of self-awareness, self-reflection, a habit of recognizing and then challenging the prejudices, the biases, the assumptions, uh, the privileges that we have. All peoples are susceptible to such biases, but awareness of them and humility about this falls away very, very quickly in the rough and tumble of argument over really fraught issues like foreign policy and especially dealing with a challenger like China. This is when it is though most badly needed. So I've talked about humility first because I believe it really is the wellspring uh, through of which the others you know, flow, the other habits of mind that we should look for. Uh, at least we should learn to recognize and expect these from the specialists that we look, look to. So humility helps us to recognize the value in other disciplines and in the other perspectives, thus leading to holism, to a holistic approach, right? Humility also leads us away from thinking of our own history as the one true path from this Whiggish teleological idea about the inevitable direction of, of our history. It helps us to recognize instead that history is deeply contingent. 
It helps us to dial down our own sense of exceptionalism. It's a spirit of humility that helps us to take this learner's stance, which I think is really important in all these things. It's, it's, it's something that helps us to recognize the importance of understanding how the Chinese see things themselves, thus leading to the all-important cognitive empathy. And humility helps cultivate that habit of self-interrogation for sources of bias. And that's the next thing that I want to talk about, the thing that we should look for in our trusted sources on China, which is that sensitivity to bias. I think that it's very, it's vitally important that we understand the optical properties of the lens through which so very much of the information that we get about China ultimately filters. And what I mainly mean here in the present context is, of course, the media. Our newspapers, our wire services, our other media uh, comprise the nearly exclusive source of knowledge for anyone who is not a trained specialist in China. That's just a fact. In fact, for most people who are analysts, I think it's still true that the most of what they think they know, especially God, in the last three years when none of us have been able to go there, it all filters through this in this case, increasingly narrow lens of the media. Reporters in turn depend on those specialists, you know, these, these same specialists who they then quote and uh, whose works they cite in their articles or on in broadcasts. So you can see how there's a real potential for echo chambers to form. Reporters are not, and they should not be trying to present a kind of neutral or objective set of facts. That is just simply impossible. Uh, but we can try as we read them or listen to their broadcasts to know something of what their privileges and their prejudices are, to give due weight to the structural biases. And I really want to emphasize the structural biases that are inherent when you are reporting, especially on a foreign country. I mean, I could do it another hour to talking about this, but let's suffice to say, I do not believe that there is some conspiracy theory among all these different media outlets to smear China and to make China look bad. The reporters I know, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to probably know 90% of the English language reporters who've worked on China in the last quarter century know, and know them personally. These are not people who are greedy and out for money or they wouldn't be reporters, believe me. It's a thankless job in so many ways. You are harassed, you're surveilled, uh, you are sometimes even detained. It's not a fun job to be a reporter. Most of them uh, do their job in the pursuit of something like truth. And they are not out there, you know, manipulating the facts to try to paint a, a, an ugly picture of China. There's something that I, I think is is uh, I heard Jiang Fan say once on on a, a a panel when she was joined by a bunch of other former and current New Yorker correspondents who write on China, and uh, she was asked uh, by the uh, the uh, editor in chief of the New Yorker uh, what. It feels like as somebody who spent her childhood in China to read Western reporting about China in the English language. And she said something really profound. She said, it's like looking at a familiar body part of mine through an X-ray. It's literally penetrating. It's accurate. It's anatomically precise. But it doesn't add up to something that I recognize as my hand or my foot, that body part of mine. It lacks those things that make it human, the, 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 the flesh and the blood that component of it. And so I think that we should understand that the accuracy, and I believe that a lot of the reporting, most reporting that, that's being done is accurate, but it does not add up to a full picture. This is not, again, the fault of the reporters themselves. They are, after all, brought up in a media environment in which, you know, it, it's, it's believed it's widely repeated among journalists that, you know, we should try to hold power to account that if we're not doing so, if what we are writing is not making those in power uncomfortable, then it's mere PR. And I, I believe that. And I am grateful for living in a country in which our, our adversarial media is always trying to, to shed that kind of light. But we need to ask ourselves whether that works when it comes to reporting about foreign countries, about countries with whom we do not have that direct experience. I can open the New York Times on any given day and read it cover to cover and read a dozen stories that would make me worry about this, the fate of our democracy. we reading about corrupt politicians who say horrible things that they dismiss as locker room talk, who you know pay porn stars or about gun uh, deaths in, in the streets about, about yet another innocent unarmed black motorist killed by cops. 
And yet I am not going to conclude that if I were to open that door, I will smell tires burning in the streets or hear the sound of people rushing to the barricades, that this country is on the brink of collapse. Actually, it might be, but I, I, I can believe that of a Sunday, I am going to drive my big goddamn SUV to Costco and fill it with things I don't need. Then I'm going to come home. And as I prepare to barbecue, my son will be playing Fortnite. And my daughter, well, before she came here, will be, you know, looking at pictures of pretty Korean pop singers and listening to K-pop. Um, and, you know, I'll think life goes on normally. And because I have that very ordinary experience, I have the lived experience of being an American. And I have the rest of those quotidian stories in the newspaper uh, you know, you don't write about the bridges that don't collapse, right? You don't write about the planes that land safely. You don't write the dog bites man stories. There is a, an inherent structural bias for the unusual, right? If it bleeds, it leads. And so it's not, it shouldn't be surprising then that if I am somebody who has not lived in China, who does not know that experience, who is not reading dozens of stories about China in, in, in a day, but only reads the five or six that are about the environmental hellscape that is the Chinese city, or about yet another case of, of you know, uh, uh, repression of, of an, uh, minority nationality I hadn't heard of until last week, or, you know, uh, yet another one of these stories about official corruption or, or about uh, a, a, a jailed rights activist or, or whatnot. Of course, I'm going to conclude, I'm, of course, I'm, my, my ideas about China are going to be formed in this way. I'm not suggesting that we ignore what the media has to say, but we just need to take this into account. We need to, to think of the optical properties of the lens as we read these stories about China and work that into our thinking. There will be bias in the reporting that we read on China, but this is not a coordinated campaign to smear China. I, I'm not going to dwell on holism as an approach to look for, except to say that there is a terrible pernicious tendency in this country right now to view China through one single lens, and that is the lens of national security. Many of the so-called experts who you'll hear, hear from have only this lens available to them in their toolkit. That's all they got. Everything is lensed through national security, and that is a dangerous thing. It's a classic case of the blind men and the elephant, and we're only touching the tusk right now, right? If we're only touching the tusk, we are not going to know anything about the, the low rest of the thing. So getting our heads around something as complex as China requires us to really see it from multiple perspectives. National security is inarguably one of them. But anyone who focuses so narrowly on that perspective that they ignore the other vitally important facets of it, the economy, business, society, elite politics, sure, but also the humanities, for Christ's sake, right? You, if you are ignoring all of these other things and you only interpret all these other facets through the filter of national security, you are doing a gigantic disservice. You need to cut such a person who does this out of your media diet or at least balance them out with a lot of other, a lot of other uh, perspectives. Uh, just as importantly, you need to be able to find people who are able to you have those dragonfly eyes, right? As Anthea Roberts popularized this phrase in my mind. It's this idea that, you know, we can see with multiple, multiple lenses, but somehow integrate them all into one complex picture, integrative complexity. It's a really important idea. And that's what I'm really talking about when I'm talking about holism. When I talk about historical acuity, I don't mean that I expect you to memorize or that you should expect the experts that you turn to to have ready uh, a list of all the emperors of the Ming and Qing dynasties, all 24 of them, by their reign dates and, and major accomplishments and treaties and battles and all that stuff. No, that is not what I expect when I mean historical acuity. In fact, what I really mean is a sensitivity to our own history and our own historiography an understanding of how we interpret history. That is the history of the West, of Europe, of its colonial offshoots. The thing to be aware of, as I hinted at before, is the teleological tendency that pervades so much of our thinking about history. Most people I, have, I, I find have real trouble letting go of the idea that history has a goal. Of course, that goal in recent years has always been, it's marching steadily toward the triumph of liberal democratic capitalism. 
Maybe that idea is not quite as popular as it once was in the immediate aftermath of the collapse of Soviet communism, but it's still out there. And you still hear it embedded in the language. When people talk about the moral arc of history is long, but bends toward justice, there's a little teleology. Even. When they talk about a country being behind the curve of history, you can smell that teleology in there. We need to really kind of wean ourselves off of that. We had, we experienced this sort of grand amnesia event after the collapse of Soviet communism in the very early 1990s. And that amnesia event has basically left us standing on one end, one side of a giant historical crevasse, looking across at the other and seeing over there Iran and uh, China and uh, the states of the Arab world and Russia and saying, come on over guys. It's great over here on this side. Just be like us, come on over. We we all drive ridiculous SUVs. We have uh, Costco and great premium cable channels. And, you know, we've got succession. Just come on. And uh, it, it's really strange. We, we don't stop to think or to look down into that chasm to realize, oh, my God, it's strewn with bodies. Oh, my God. We had to pass through all these narrative files. There was so much contingency in history. There were so many lucky throws of the die, so many lucky draws of the core card or tosses of the coin or what, what have you that got us to where we are. Like it could have gone another way really, really easily. And we don't realize that. We don't understand that. We don't understand also the gravitational pull of history, how difficult it is for us to escape, to attain, for, for anyone to attain escape velocity from their history or we have this unrealistic expectation that it can be done in a single generation, that it can be done just at a whim, that we can just easily leap over there. I mean, we, we, when we shop for our China experts, and I'm using the word shopping, I'm thinking about Costco still, sorry. Um, look for that sensitivity to disparate historical experience and look for that, that awareness of contingency so now we come to the fifth, and I think most important, which is cognitive empathy. Now, empathy is something, unless we were born psychopaths or we're really far down that old spectrum, it's something that we're all pretty much born with. And, and we can kind of reflexively exercise ordinary empathy. I don't need to know much about you to feel what you feel when you tell me that your dog has died something like that. It's very easy for humans to extend that kind of empathy. But when we're trying to extend it to something very different from us, I mean, sure, we're all human, but we get taught very different things in school, us and the Chinese. We're brought up on entirely separate vocabularies of historical and mythological archetypes. We grew up listening to different fables and fairy tales. We have different pantheons of heroes and villains. We have totally different understandings of our own histories and ourselves. And we have different national nightmares. We have experiences of the world that are quite disparate and it's not enough to feel emotional empathy. You need informed empathy. That's what I, the, the maybe less fancy word for cognitive empathy. With enough knowledge that we can imagine it, we can put ourselves into that headspace. And if we've you know, taking time to understand the very different influences, the very different assumptions, the different habits of mind, the different mental furnishings that inhabit their headspace, we can come to something like a decent representation, at least, of what is going to go through their heads, how they will respond to the things that we do, either rhetorically or in terms of our policy or our behavior or our deployment of military forces. Let, let me offer just one important piece of that mental furniture for you. This is something that I would, if I had to, if somebody asked me, okay, like give me an example of, of that kind of mental furnishings. What I would always reach for is this. Understand the compressed nature of China's modernization over the last 40-ish years, 45 years, say, since reform and opening began. What is the current per capita GDP of China? It's something like... $12,000 today, right? What was it in 1979? It's a very dawn of reform and opening. It was something like $178. You guys can do the math and you'll, you'll see that it's a four digit percentage increase. It's a big, big old increase, right? Now, what does that mean? That means that somebody who was graduating from 
high school, or as is probably more often the case, junior high in 1979 and taking their first job is only was only a few years ago thinking about retiring. This has all happened in the course of one working lifetime. Just to give you an illustration, I went to China for the first time in 1981. And then Beijing had a grand total of two buildings that were more than 10 stories tall. Today, you, you see the Beijing skyline. It's got some of the tallest buildings in the world. It's a forest of gleaming steel and concrete, right? You, you look at China's high-speed rail trains and things like that. This is a country where in 1981, the streets were filled with donkey carts and bicycles. There were no privately owned automobiles. Everyone dressed in sort of dull gray or green or blue, quote unquote, Mao suits. Uh, the changes are just incredibly profound. But what, what does this tell us? That, this, that, that they've gone from that to what we see today in such a short time. I think that it's done three things, and then maybe a lot more, but three that I wanna, I wanna focus on. And to the way that Chinese people take in uh, their experience and, and much of the rest of the world. For one, you know, Americans are often, I mean, if I had to boil down the great American question about China, it's, it's always, why don't you hate your government as much as I think you should? Think about that. Isn't that what Americans often want to know about China? And to answer that, I think we can go very far by understanding that in that experience of across the last 45 years, they have not a whole ton of reason to be uh, skeptical of the ability of the party leadership to steer them into uncertain futures and to do it without getting involved in any wars since 1979, without any major societal disruption, save 1989. Uh, arguably, you know, what we saw in November of, of, of this last year with the end of the rapid end of COVID, but still, I mean, who's talking about that even today? Uh, but no, there's there have been you know very few disruptions. So that's one thing, a, a an increased confidence, or what should strike you as an unsurprising confidence in the ability of the leadership to steer them into uncertain futures. A second thing that it does, and I think this is really important, is it gives them a different relationship with technology. In their lived experience, what they've seen is as their connectivity has improved as the, the, their access to information, the device that they carry with them has improved, so to have their lives in lockstep. This has meant that while we are here hand wringing over the advent of chat GPT-4, and maybe we should be, and while we're really, really worried about uh, the impact that, that uh, technology is having on our society, while we're all worried about how to get, in my case, our kids to spend less time on their screens, they're mostly too busy to talk about that because they're spending too much time on their screens. They live in a world where it's, they, they're, they're in their Star Trek phase and we've moved on to our kind of black mirror phase, right? Where we're very worried about technology, but this has a lot to do, I think, with the relationship uh, that, that they've had, with their experience uh, with, with technology. So it shouldn't, shouldn't surprise us. A third thing that it's done, is it, it, it goes far to explain what often surprises people. We look at China, like I said, gleaming forests of skyscrapers and that high-speed rail that everyone always cites as the impressive thing. And, you know, pl plenty else. Uh, all that, that, that gleaming infrastructure. We, uh, we think they should be a really, you know, modern and mature superpower. Like, like we should be able to take a joke, right? Should be able to take a little bit of ridding or accept some criticism. Why are the Chinese so damn thin-skinned? I think that they're sort of like Tom Hanks in the old 90s movie, Big, where they went to bed about 11 years old and woke up suddenly in the morning, you know, 35, Tom Hanks in an adult body, uh, where on the ex externally, they look like an adult. And I don't mean this as any slight, that, you know, we cannot expect uh, in the course of one biological generation for people's minds to, to change nearly as fast as the, the, the software as we can expect the hardware to change. So I think this goes far to explain some of the, the major differences uh, that we see uh, when it comes to China. So 
Cognitive empathy in this case is mainly about understanding how Chinese elites view the world around them, and especially in crisis situations like the one that we're in now. Understanding how they interpret our behaviors and understanding how they see our actions. That's why I talk often about strategic empathy. It's about that move that we should look for, they, that, that analyst that we look to. His first move, her first move should be to turn the chessboard around, to tell you what the board looks like from the, the other player's vantage point. Uh, this is something that political scientists call security dilemma sensibility. It's the ability to put yourself in your counterparty's shoes and see it from your own, how your own behaviors are perceived. And the difference between empathy and sympathy is very simple. We, this does not call on you to abdicate your own values. No, you sort, sort of hang them at the coat check before you step into that magic chamber that allows you to see the view out, out your counterparty's window. And you can put them right back on afterward. And whether you want to contain and contest China's control, whether you want to engage in China in some way, whether you want to do business in China, invest in China, start a rock band in China, whatever you, it is that you want to do, this is a good first move. This is a, an attribute that, that you should take on. Happily, I think there are a lot of people who work on China who are publishing in major magazines like or in affairs, or in Financial Times, or in Washington Post, or the Journal, who really do embody all of the qualities that I've talked about. And I'd be happy to even name names of, of, of people who I think are is fantastic. People like Jessica Chen Weiss, at, who teaches at Cornell. People like Jude Blanchett at the, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. People like Ryan Haas at the Brookings Institution. People like Susan Thornton, who served, surprisingly, maybe under the Trump administration as the, the acting assistant deputy secretary of state for East Asia and Pacific. These are fantastic people. I urge you to, to make this though your checklist, to look for these qualities, the humility, the awareness of, 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 of where bias creeps in, people who have those dragonfly eyes, people who understand sort of the, the role of contingency in history, and above all, this cognitive empathy. Make this your checklist. Look for evidence of these qualities before you subscribe to that Substack or before you, you know, uh, you follow that guy or that woman on Twitter, or most importantly, before you vote for that politician. So I've recommended these five qualities of cognition, these, these five habits of mind as things to look for when deciding what voices you should be listening to as a non-specialist. But I hope it's clear to those of you listening who do aspire to be specialists and I really hope that some of you do so aspire, that these are also five precepts you should embrace in your own approach, whether it's toward China or indeed toward any other country, or indeed toward people of other political parties in this country. I tried to do the same thing, hard as it is, to extend cognitive empathy to the Trump voter, for example. Be sensitive to the presence of that structural bias in the news media that you consume that does include in reporting about your fellow compatri your compatriots. Be conscious of your own understanding of history and the way that that affects the way you think about how other countries experience their history. It might be quite radically different. This will help you become a better scholar, a more discerning thinker, and a better informed citizen. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed speaking with you. Guys.